This episode was made possible by our generous patrons. to episode 145 of the Ink to Film podcast, where we read the book and then see the movie. I'm Luke. And I'm James. And this week we discuss William Peter Blatty's 1971 horror novel, The Exorcist. All right, man, this is a big one. This is a genre-defining type project, uh, something that I think we've we've been circling for a while here, and it's time to finally get to it. I mean, get a little creepy in this summer. You know, genre-defining is, is definitely something I was thinking about because this this is the demon and in, in a way this is the horror movie like this is the gold standard yeah. i would say horror story um mm-hmm. but but if if somebody was to you know sort of push back against that i would say it's at least the demon the sort of like biblical possession movie absolutely i mean it's footprint in like pop culture uh horror movies and stories is just massive like like so many things are sort of in dialogue with this story. Um, I, I'm thinking of uh, Paul Tremblay's Head Full of Ghost is another a book that I'm hoping we'll get to cover at some point on the podcast because it's supposed to be getting an adaptation. Um, it is it is directly in dialogue with The Exorcist, I think. Um, mm-hmm. And for the people who have read that will know what I'm talking about. Um, it's and, and all over the place too, though, right? Like you, it's it's the idea of like a hero priest protagonist who comes in to do battle with a demon i mean (laughs) yeah how many times have you heard the power of christ compels you or you know any of those (laughs) lines that are shouted out like uh, i mean it's a quintessential at least horror like if you're to make a list of of like Mm -hmm. the greatest most monumental horror movies it's on the list easily yeah and i mean i don't know about your copy but my copy of the novel uh right across the top it says the most terrifying novel ever written which is a bold statement. It also not attri- not, not attributed to anyone. It's just a just a, you just it's <laughs> no. Just that's like there. that's that's his tagline. He was like, <laughs> so says the Lord. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, I actually heard that he didn't intend for it to be sort of a creep out movie. It was like supposed to be a movie about like in conversation with religion and and the sort of mm-hmm. some of that kind of stuff. Interesting, because. Uh, so it's been a while. We should definitely talk about our sort of history with this because right. I had not read the book before. Me neither. I have seen the movie. I think I've seen the movie twice. I think I saw it once when I was fairly young, and I remember it freaking me out, but um, I don't think it made this like lasting impression on me that a lot of people have, right? And I think maybe because it was a little bit of an older movie, and I saw it at a time in which I that was a turnoff for me. I don't know. <laughs> you mm-hmm. know? And then um, I saw it again later on. I think I liked it more the second time. Um, but even that was probably over 10 years ago now. And while reading this book, I kept going, did that happen in the movie? I can't remember. So I know that there's a lot of like the particulars of the film that I have forgotten. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm going to be really excited when we get to the film to revisit it. I, I am curious, what what is your experience with The Exorcist? Um, I assume you also hadn't read the book. Yeah, no, I hadn't read the book, but uh, definitely... I was thinking a lot about the first time that I saw it and it was one of these sort of sleepover situations with with a few people. Luckily it wasn't one of the ones where like people were distracting. Like all of us were into it and watching it and mm-hmm. we were definitely too young to be seeing it. Um and it was terrifying and it did definitely did leave this lasting impression on okay. me and uh I it was one of the like it's for me it was like I could look to that movie and be like that terrified me. And uh-huh. um I think I have some theories on why. I've talked a little bit on the podcast about like being raised in like a religious household and um i think and to some extent you were as well right or you went to catholic school or something right yes i went to after school catholic school i guess if you want to call it that we i'd go to a church and and uh have a a class where we would learn about stuff Mm -hmm. um although my sort of agnosticism was started out in in those classes because i remember have feeling deep skepticism about it um, but I wouldn't say that our, our household was like deeply religious. It, it was, it was always kind of there, but, um, we weren't like people who attended church every weekend or anything like that. Every Sunday, right. we were never that. So I don't know how that compares to, to what you 
what you uh experienced. we were like a go to church every sunday family for sure and i remember you know early i think when you're very young it's really easy to just understand that that's how things are but as i started to grow up um i found i found that i was like sort of i was feeling shame due to the fact that i wasn't able to like connect like everybody else around me was and sort of believe in this like true and like i don't know without question sort of way and you know maybe mm-hmm. that was just like my process through it but eventually like it led to me that in addition to some you know many other things led me to considering myself agnostic and not really believing in christianity or any any of like the specifics of of that religion can, can i ask you what what age you were where you when you started to sort of self-identify that way or, or yeah i mean can you remember a time yeah i definitely it was definitely around like 12 or 13 years old Okay, so th- that's about the same for me, I think. Like early middle school is where I started to f- really feel like that was that was where I was going. Right. And so, but I saw this movie around the same time. You know, I saw this mm-hmm. movie around like the idea of of a priest feeling shame uh for not believing potentially or like losing losing faith was very like, you know, very in the moment for me. I was like, "Holy shit, yeah. this is this is crazy." And the, and then seeing a demon child. And so like like I was saying, I have spoken about this on the podcast before a little bit. I think around the time that we covered Good Omens, uh mm-hmm. how I felt I you know, and maybe this is just from my background, but I feel like coming and and having religion built into a story kind of has this universal baggage for people. So you're bringing a lot to a story that deals with religion, especially if you're raised in a religious household or raised near religion. But on top of that, you sort of, even if, even if you don't, I feel like people still see religion, specifically like this sort of Catholicism, um, Christianity, all of that to be sort of, it's like, it's still like, ancient and it feels like important even if you you know what i mean like it's still to be respected i would say i you know i don't identify with any of that stuff at this point in my life and still i i you know i'm not like actively going around shitting on it and and i'm not also i also don't identify as an atheist for a reason okay well i mean that that's also probably generous of you and and something that i try and do and and that's to remember that people do believe this stuff right like this is people's religions and there are Catholics who buy into the idea of demons and think that it's very, very real and believe in exorcisms. Um, I personally do not. Um, I am actually, that's one of the things I want to talk about with this novel. Um, only a little bit though. Um, kind of like what we did with Jaws. I want to at least kind of acknowledge it at the top um, in that I, in our coverage of Jaws, I said that, you know, sharks are animals. They're not monsters. And, this book is about a shark that is a monster. And so I had to sort of suspend that part of me that recognizes that this is not true about sharks and that many, many sharks were killed because of the film Jaws and be able to still enjoy the movie. Um, And that's where I'm at with this because, in my opinion, exorcisms are not real because I don't believe in demons. And so what is actually happening when they do this is horrifying is actually sort of torturing a child usually and not addressing mental health issues that are present and sort of mystifying it and and shrouding it in all this secrecy and there's cases the case of Annalise uh, Michelle um, which was the basis for the film the exorcism of Emily Rose was like roughly mm-hmm. based off of that that uh, case and I know that there has been some episodes of some podcasts that have talked about it like a uh, case file my favorite murder, uh, the BuzzFeed Unsolved YouTube channel did, a, did an episode on it, and it. I would recommend people go check those out if they want to like get into like real world exorcisms and what has actually happened. Um, but all that being said, this is a work of fiction, right? And I I want to engage with it as a work of fiction. I think that's where I land on it because ultimately, like, I don't believe in demons. I, I'm agnostic. I don't believe in. I don't believe in any religion. You know, I don't believe in angels. I don't believe in demons. I don't believe in. I don't believe in the god uh, God per se. Right. And I think you know this. This book does engage with sort of mental illness and and the idea of a demon at the same time in an inter- in an interesting way because the way that I read this book and like you said, sort of feel feel like I'm able to engage with it is that it is it's not the real world it's like it's been it's clear that the characters are actually seeing demons in this story to me at least like I like the characters are actually seeing some sort of world where there are demons so Um, I want to talk about that because that's actually really interesting because this book is written in a way in which 
I think that if you read it without having seen the film, it, it feels like it's it's trying to walk the line of, is she or isn't she? And um, even the priest is highly skeptical. He has to have he has to have like obvious repeated evidence shown, him, and he'll find ways to to like explain it away. Oh no no no! It actually could have been this. It could have been this. And it feels like he's bending over backwards to not believe it, which I think is actually a really effective way of writing this novel, especially for someone like me who isn't ready to completely believe. Um, the problem is I have sort of been tainted by my viewing of the film, where I know that in the the like quote-unquote, uh, like, truth of the novel, like, there is a demon. Like, I know that. And, and and I think it's unambiguous about that. Like, I don't think people are watching The Exorcist and going, was she actually not, uh, you know, uh, uh, being possessed by a demon? And this is all just psychosis? No one, I don't think anyone's actually saying that, right? Like, right. E even though the book is sort of written as if that might be the case. And it's only at the end where I think it really decides that that is not the case. Well, yeah, I think the book does an interesting thing where it allows you to be as skeptical as you would be in real life. Mm -hmm. You know, it allows you to, to go through your process of no, it, yeah, like he mm -hmm. says, it's it's got to be something, some weird coincidence, you know, this sort of, it, it, they start, he starts to make some really interesting sort of jumps, by the way, by the, by, by the end, he, uh, he's trying to justify that it's not a demon by saying things that are also just as implausible. Yeah, yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, like, <laughs> yeah, oh, no, some sort about. of, uh, you know, telekinesis is being used or like some sort of, you know, like she's moving things with her mind. And I'm like, uh -huh. that's, that's the same sort of ballpark as a demon for me so yeah you know he's no like and, and it's presented as well this is a well-known phenomenon now this isn't actually supernatural or hard to do you know yeah. right. which i was like hmm okay <laughs> yeah no i agree but yeah it allows you to be skeptical just up until the end and then once when, when you when he finally determines that there's a there's a demon i think the reader is supposed to go along with it at that point because we've been given right. all the evidence and all the chances to see that it wasn't this is one of the first times where i've I felt like my experience with the novel was maybe not the first time, but this is a time <laughs> where my experience with the novel, I think was sort of diminished by my viewing of the film. Um, and that's because a lot of those parts, the is she, isn't she parts, um, while still sort of um, effective in selling it, which I think is, which is important. Like you have to believe at least it, within the fiction that this is real. Mm -hmm. Um, which I, you know, it's a weird distinction to make, but I, hopefully you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> like the, um, you're not just like, no, this is completely impossible. Um, mm. And I, I, I struggled with a lot of those parts because it felt like, okay, come on, get on with it. We know that in this world, this is real. So why are we spending so much time on this? Um, and there was a lot of pages devoted to it, in my opinion. Yeah. You know, I did think there was a lot of different conversations that were kind of repeating the same sort of things that we knew and the research that, that the priest kept doing sort of was rehashing all the stuff many, many times to the point where, you know, as the reader, having seen the movie, like you say, like, I'm like, all right, let's get on with it. I'm, I, I know that this is where we're leading. So let's yeah. just get to the point where we, we can confront this, this demon. So I do want to come back to that quote that the most terrifying novel ever written, um, because I wanted to revisit something we talked about with Pet Cemetery, right? Where we have read in other places that it is considered by some to be Stephen King's most terrifying novel. Um, and whenever I look at, uh, look up that online, I see lots of people saying how, you know, th this is not his most terrifying novel. How can people say this? And um, this one, um, it was an interesting claim. And I was thinking about how there are, there's going to be a certain kind of person who is going to be willing to read a book about a demon and willing to read some of the like really sort of um, explicit and profane and just really vulgar scenes that are in here. Um, and yet is going to be the kind of person who also deeply believes in demons and angels and religion. And for that person, this book is going to be extremely terrifying because they, this is going to hit them in a place where they feel viscerally that this is real. They're going to be looking at every shadow. They're going to be like, they're going to be interpreting things in their lives and going like, oh, I can't believe I got a call about my aunt dying when I was like reading this book or whatever. And now it's right. like, oh, that was because I read this book. And they're going to make exactly. these connections, you know, and 
Um, yeah, I mean, I will say like there's a certain it's it's fun, right? It's fun to think like, oh, it's so it, it's fun to get scared. And in, in my opinion, like I you know that I like horror for for that reason a lot of the time and many other reasons, but just the idea of there being demons and how terrifying that is, like the, these beings that are sort of, you know, embodiments of evil and they don't have like a real reason for doing it. They just want to fuck with you and kill you and that kind of stuff. Like that's terrifying. And I will say, I, you know, I was reading this book some of the time in the dead of night, the wee, in the wee hours, three or four o'clock in the morning. And I definitely, you know, I definitely allowed my brain to go to a place where I was like, what if some demon shit did happen right now? You know yeah. what I mean? Like, I definitely am I'm open to, to that sort of thing. <laughs> but but I also, you know, I'm also at the same time in those moments, I'm strong enough to be like, OK, well, obviously they're not real. And like, I'll, you know, maybe I'll pull my hand up. Uh, like if I'm like if I'm going to bed that night and I have my hand off the bed, maybe I'll pull my hand up off the side or something like that. You know what I mean? But <laughs> uh-huh. but like it's not it's not uh, it's sort of just like a oh, yeah, just in case, you know, I'd be skeptical enough right. to, to just be like just in case. That's interesting. You know, it's like it, clearly it's a spectrum, right? And it sounds like you're maybe a little bit in from the complete disbelief, just enough to allow yourself to get that little bit of a thrill. I've been watching this. Um, I, I mentioned BuzzFeed Unsolved earlier, and they do a series where they go around to this is kind of beside the point, but I'm making a point related to what we're talking about. Um, they go around to different quote unquote haunted places in the country and they go in and like spend a bunch of time in this like old insane insane asylum that is like mm-hmm. been reported to be haunted and like different and, and areas like, like I that. I will say stuff I, I like going on ghost tours and stuff like that yeah. too. I don't believe in this stuff, but I kind of in a way I kind of want to, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, so the, what I'm trying to get at is the two hosts. Um, one of them is a believer in the supernatural. One of them believes in ghosts and believes in demons and stuff like that. The other one vehemently does not. He's extremely skeptical of all of it, and it's really funny to see how just how skeptical he is and how like immune to fear in these situations he is when the other guy's like freaking out because he'll be convinced he heard something or whatever. And it's, it makes for entertaining viewing. And I was thinking about how much I identify with, with the skeptic because that that's totally me at this point. Like, like uh, I, I want, I want to see something. I, I would like to have my mind changed. So I'd be willing to go on these sort of, you know, things like I'd be willing to go to somewhere that's supposed to be deeply haunted and like spend the night there and, you know, all that stuff. Like, I'd be willing to do that in the hope that I might see something. Um, but I just don't think I would. I, I'm just too skeptical. And I think there's too many times where your your own brain will play tricks on you. Um, right. and, and I think that kind of explains a lot of phenomenon. But um, the believing in ghosts and stuff, I know is like a huge topic that that is something that people are going to have, you know, a million different opinions on. Um, but I think it's pertinent to talking about this book just so you can understand as a listener where we're coming from right because if we were very different people um with very different belief systems i think this book is going to affect us in a different way right and i think that gets back around to sort of what i was saying with uh you know writing a story with the baggage of anything biblical or religious the people who who specifically have engaged with that religion or are religious in some way are going to be affected in in so many different ways and, and like kind of what I was trying to say before, even people that don't don't believe in any of it still see like sort of, and understand some of the history and some of like the why people believe what they do and sort of that kind of stuff. So I think like it, it in writing a story with religion, in it, you're you're automatically having some red flags fl- flick up for people and sort of you're able to, you know, th- that setup of sort of like this is, an, you know, this is wh- how, why people believe this is, you know, the idea of like desecrating statues and stuff like even if you're not religious, you understand why like throwing blood on the on, on like a statue of the Virgin Mary is affecting to people and things like that or like the sure. and like a, like or like one of the most and I guess we should say now if if you're squeamish or, or you know, you, you're you would be affected by specifically anything to do with a child or and and there's a lot of like rough stuff yeah. that happens with a child and sexuality Vulgar, and some of that stuff gross stuff absolutely uh, that's a good point to put should... some some warnings up top um i assume you know that if, if you're I did, if you're aware at all of what the exorcist is about but the book is probably even more vulgar and sort of extreme than the movie because of what can be described in the book um, right. to me exceeds what could even be shown on screen right and so so uh, you know to get to the point where the demon has taken over the child and uh, the things that are said about Jesus, like, fuck me, Jesus, and, and like, yeah. you know, masturbating with a cross, like, all this, like, that sort yeah. of stuff, even if you're not religious, has baggage that you can understand as a as a reader. Yeah, absolutely. So, anyway, I, I think that's why they're able to make this claim, right? Because, because it is dancing that line of uh, stuff that people really believe. And speaking of that, I, I want to talk a little bit about Peter Blatty and the writing of this novel and 
what he drew on because i think it's really interesting that um it has later been he i don't know if he he admitted this at the time but um it was the novel itself was inspired by a 1949 case of demonic possession an exorcism that bloody had heard about while he was a student at georgetown i think he, he knew this you know what i mean going in like he knew that he was dealing with this he also was raised by a very religious um mother and um considered himself a catholic so i think he himself uh is the kind of person who was probably affected by this. And it's fascinating to me that this was not written by someone who would consider himself an atheist or something. and was just sort of like fucking around and, mm -hmm. and, and, and sort of triggering Catholics. Um, he's someone who believed this kind of stuff. So, so he, he wrote it from, I guess what you would call like an honest place and that he, um, in theory, uh, believed these sorts of things to be true. I didn't know that. It's really interesting. Yeah, so uh, let's talk about him a little bit. William Peter Blatty uh, was an American writer and filmmaker who is best known for The Exorcist, um, which he also wrote the screenplay for, which um, right. uh, I'm sure I, we'll talk about more next I week. I want to jump in real quick. I was I did the dual reading that we do sometimes. I did audiobook and book reading, and yeah. he was the narrator for my audiobook. Yeah, same. I listened to... Uh, I did the same thing, audiobook uh -huh. and physical copy. Yeah, and... Uh, it was pretty fun hearing him. He was good too. He was a good. He was a good narrator. Definitely great, like yeah. voice acting and and yeah. I mean, I thought I, I was just blown away by that. I was like, wow. Wrote the screenplay, wrote this story, and also was you know willing to to do the audiobook, which I thought was really a, like a good performance. Right, and uh, I should also say that I have the 40th uh, anniversary edition of The Exorcist, in which he did some changes. Uh, it's like an updated version. That's um, the version that I was I was wondering what was changed because that's the version I read as well. Yeah. So uh, I know this isn't exactly the book that was adapted for the movie, but mm -hmm. he has said elsewhere that he wants to be remembered for this version of the book. Like he wants this to be the definitive version. So I think it's OK that we read it, um, although I'm not. I'm not really sure what all the differences are. I, I didn't try and I, I didn't realize that there was it, there was that, that many changes when I bought it. Um, so I wasn't going to go out and buy another copy of the older version um, just because. Um, so I don't know. Hopefully it's it's still um, pretty accurate. So anyway, um, he he was a screenwriter. He uh, was a novelist. He worked on many things, but I, I was looking through them like they didn't they didn't ring a lot of bells to me. So let's, uh, I'll list some novel names. He wrote the novels Which Way to Mecca, Jack, John Goldfarb, Please Come Home, I, Billy Shakespeare, Twinkle, 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 Killer Kane, uh, The Exorcist, The Ninth Configuration, Legion, um, Demeter, Crazy. Anyway, a bunch of books that I haven't really heard of. I do know that Legion, which he wrote in 1983, formed the basis of The Exorcist Three. Oh, I did want to address that actually. I have never seen any of The Exorcist besides the first one. I guess, I guess technically, I have seen the Emily Rose one, but I don't know if that counts. No, no, no. that's. I mean, that's outside. That's not the same right. universe. That's a different filmmaker. Right. Um, completely making a different kind of movie. I think. Um, fascinating movie actually, and interesting to think about with, as it relates to the true story that they're they're sort of referencing. But anyway, um, I would be curious maybe to to. I, I'm. I want to know more about why Exorc the Exorcist Two was made, uh, not adapted from a Peter Blatty novel, um, and I don't think written by him. I don't think he wrote the screenplay, but I could be wrong. And then uh, Exorcist Three is made, where he does come in and and do it. So I don't know. It's really interesting that that happened. I'm sure there's more there. I'm sure it has a lot to do with the the first one did Gangbusters, and they wanted to replicate that. And then there wasn't another you know novel with his material for the exorcist stuff that that was out yet probably right if i just had to guess but i don't yeah. know yeah so born in 1928 he actually died in 2017 so not really that long ago um at the age of 89 he uh was uh the the fifth and youngest child of a Le of lebanese immigrants um his mother mary was a devout catholic his parents separated when he was a toddler. He was raised in, in what he described as comfortable destitution by his deeply religious mother, uh, whose sole support came from peddling homemade quince jelly in the, street of Man the streets of Manhattan, uh, which I don't know what quince jelly is. Apparently, it's like some sort of fruit. I never heard of this. Um, but he, was he lived at 28 different addresses during his childhood because of non-payment of rent. So he was bouncing around a lot. Um, 
Throughout his life, uh, he also was married four times and had seven children. Catholics have lots of children. I do know that tends to be <laughs> tends to be true. Um, married four times and having seven children it does seem like a lot, but teach their own. He went to Brooklyn Preparatory, which is a Jesuit school on a scholarship and graduated as class valedictorian in 1946, later attended Georgetown U University and got a bachelor's degree in English. So he does have this background in this religion stuff, right? Like he went to a Jesuit school. He was raised by, raised by a deep religious mother and con he him considered himself a Catholic. So it's fascinating that he would write The Exorcist, which people lost their minds about, right? Like <laughs> this was a Satan book. This was you know, hugely controversial when it, when it came out and then was only inflamed by the, the film that came out, I think, just two years later. Yeah. So fascinating to, to look at and to think about. It does seem like he had a long career writing for both television, uh, film, and for his books. Um, had, a, had, a, had a nice career, but was always well-known, super well-known for The Exorcist. Which, by the way, I also saw, which I know we're going to get into this kind of stuff next week, but uh, first horror film ever nominated for a Academy Award for Best Picture, I think. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a huge role to fill. You know, the first horror film to ever be nominated is crazy. Yeah, it's cool. I mean, we have talked about with our Silence of the Lamb coverage how how uh, horror film didn't really get the respect that, that other genres were getting. Um, so it's interesting to see this one was, was sort of early in, in the, you know, as sort of like knocking on that door. Right. I mean, it was, what, 1973-ish, right? Yeah, film came out in 1973, I believe. So, I mean, that's 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 early days in comparison to something like Silence of the Lambs, too. It's like 20 years before. Yeah. So if that, you know, that's, that. I think it goes to show the success of the movie, too. But we'll talk about that next week a little more. Right. The novel was hugely successful, it had actually topped the New York Times bestseller list for 17 weeks and remained on the list for 57 consecutive weeks, sold more than 13 million copies in the United States alone, and was translated into over a do dozen languages. Um, and that was, you know, all <laughs> coupled with the fact that it was not uh, adapted into this, like, iconic film version, right? That is actually even more famous than the book, I would argue. In which he wrote the screenplay for, which is cool. Like, you don't hear about that very often. I, I mean, I always find that to be really interesting because that means that he was able to have probably some really good input on sort of some of the things that, you know, we talked about earlier how this the, the movie may have deviated from some of the ideas from the book, but he, he had a hand in that in some ways. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he wrote the screenplay, so he had to have. Um only other thing I saw in his uh, biography here that I really wanted to touch on, uh, in 1961... Uh, Blatty appeared as a contestant on the Groucho Marx quiz show You Bet Your Life in which he won $10,000 which he used to quit his job and write full time which after that he never had a regular job and he persisted solely on his writing wow that's super replicatable too <laughs> yeah. that's cool we should I'll just try to go on uh, what was it could you would you bet your life you bet your life let's do that uh, Groucho Marx and then all quit show. our day jobs Gosh, 1961. That's really cool. I wonder though. how much that is today. More than $10,000, I assume. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so that's uh, William Peter Blatty. Um, I think we've talked a lot about sort of the, the all this, all the stuff surrounding this novel. Um, I, I'm ready to get into some plot, but I, I do want to ask you, has anything creepy happened for you in the last week? I mean, not that I could point to and say this definitely happened, but like I said, I was getting, uh, there was a couple times where I was like, maybe I will just, you know, my, I'll pull my foot from the edge of the bed and it'll be a little more in the, in the center. And like, I did feel, like I said, I, it would, I typically was reading this after my partner had gone to sleep and uh, I was like reading into the later hours and it was like, once you get to that sort of witching hour, once you get to like three or four, somewhere in there, uh -huh. three o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning. Uh, 
you start to you're like you said you're 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 i feel like your mind can start to play tricks on you and i do i wanted to ask you because like you know you say you don't believe in that stuff but do you feel yourself still get the heebie-jeebies every now and again with something like that like in the middle of the night when you're all alone in the darkness or is it sort of like the thing if you do feel that way is it sort of like oh there could be a you know a masked killer in my closet or something <laughs> like, like something more grounded and real uh, uh true crime does give me a certain visceral uh, fear that I, I I struggle to get from a lot of other stuff because it is completely plausible to me because <laughs> right. th- these are things that really happened. Um, I, I don't want to say it never happens. It, it can happen, um, especially when I'm like sort of on the edge of sleep. And I think uh, I, I will have times where I'll wake up and I'll see something that looks like a fucking monster standing in the corner or something. Right. And then like, like I a have jacket. a moment where I, I get kind of freaked out. And then like, yeah, it's like a chair with a jacket draped over it. And then there's like a like a lamp hanging over the top that looks like a head. And it's all just the way it all blends together in the darkness, you know. Right. Um, stuff like that will happen. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and, and that's what I feel like a lot of this stuff is, right? Like, it's your brain trying to make sense of something. Um, there's a phenomenon where, like, you're, you'll see faces even when they're not there. And it's because we, you know, psychologically evolved to recognize danger. That's the theory, at least. Yeah. And so, you know, you'll see something that looks like a face even though it's not. And I think a lot of that can lead to these, like ghost sightings that that people i mean but anyway that's my own pet theory you know what i think it was for me too is like there's a blending of things that i I feel like i've been consuming recently like recently finished the last of us 2 and i we me and my girlfriend have also been watching you'll be gone in the dark the hbo documentary that's about true crime and then also the exorcist and like golden state killer you blend those things together and i I guess you kind of get me in like a heightened state uh come, come nighttime yeah and it's interesting because like i'll get freaked out about movies um that are not even trying to be realistic you know what i mean like it's just a full-on monster um you know it's just different i guess because of this like i know that it is trying to play on real world fears and so i I, it just hits me in a weird spot where i have my i have my guard up about it i guess in in a way i guess you yeah that makes sense anyway well let's get into some plot and then we can we can discuss some specifics with this novel so an elderly Jesuit priest named Father Lancaster Marin is leading an archaeological dig in northern Iraq and is studying ancient relics. After discovering a small statue to the demon Pazuzu, which, by the way, is an actual ancient Assyrian demon, uh, a series of omens alerts him to a pending confrontation with a powerful evil, which, unknown to the reader at this point, he has battled before in an exorcism in Africa. Meanwhile, in Georgetown, a young girl named Reagan McNeil is living with her famous mother, actress Chris McNeil, who is in Georgetown filming a movie. As Chris finishes her work on the film, Regan begins to become inexplicably ill. After a gradual series of poltergeist-like disturbances in their rented house, for which Chris attempts to find rational explanations, Regan begins to rapidly undergo disturbing psychological and physical changes. She refuses to eat or, or sleep, becomes withdrawn and frenetic, and increasingly aggressive and violent. Chris initially mistakes Regan's behavior as a result of repressed anger over her parents' divorce and absent father. Now, I'm realizing I'm saying Regan. Is it Reagan? Is it Reagan or Regan? I think it's Reagan, but that always makes me think of the president, and I'm just like... Yeah, it's weird saying like, Reagan, right? Like, yeah. This was this before he was president? Probably. I think it, I think it was. Okay, yeah, because naming a character Reagan is like would be kind of odd to do loaded, today, right? Pretty loaded. <laughs> pretty at this pretty point. loaded. Yeah, and, and here's yeah, and then the character Obama walked up. You know, right. like, yeah, it's gonna be a loaded term. <laughs> anyway, uh, Reagan or Reagan, I'm not really sure. Which is funny because I listened to an audio book where he said the name a million times. I just can't remember whether it was Reagan or Reagan. Okay. Let's pick one anyway. and stick to it. Uh, I'll go back and forth between them. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so that's the setup for the novel. Um, did you know that it was that this Pazuzu is like a real demon, quote unquote, real demon? That that, that this is I don't know, Luke. You said real demon a couple times now. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> no, I didn't. I, I didn't know that. I I kind of just well, I mean, I guess I just assumed that there was some sort of biblical, you know, research that this could back up in some way, like the so demon Pazuzu. It's actually a sense. Syrian demon. I think from I'm looking at it now, it looks like an ancient Mesopotamian religion. So he was trying to I think by choosing this demon to maybe broaden it away from just Catholicism. Right. And there's Make a couple other spots ancient. in the book where he talks about how other religions have dealt with exorcisms too. Once right. again, I think trying to broaden it out from just Catholicism. 
Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so I'm looking here. It says, uh, Pazuzu is the, was the king of demons of the wind, brother to Humbaba and son of the god Hambi. He also represented the southwestern wind, the bearer of storms and drought. There's a there's a movie, a fairly recent movie that this is making me think of, but I don't want to say what it is because I don't want it to spoil that there's demons and shit in it. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, fair enough. But like it's well, like well, this this sort of the sort of lore of a bunch of different demons and sort of what they did. It was very popular very popular a20 i'll say a24 film okay well check this out he is often depicted as a combination of diverse animal and human parts he has a body of a man the head of a lion or dog talons of an eagle two pairs of wings a scorpion's tail and a serpentine penis hell yeah <laughs> hell yeah <laughs> That's a funny reaction. <laughs> yeah. I, I, the, like, Hell yeah, serpentine penis. <laughs> you know, like I again, this is this is a situation where maybe it's older than Catholicism, older than, than Christianity, then like you're bringing in sort of pagan gods and that sort of stuff that, that yeah. has tons of like lore that you can look into. And, um, you know, it's from a time that I feel like people were more likely to see mental illness and, and say demon and that kind of thing. Yeah. Like this book kind of uh, touches on. Well, and... and to me, it's de <laughs> it's kind of deliberately throwing gas on the fire of controversy, right? Because he's using a real demon <laughs> in his right. book about a possession that is going to be controversial. Like he had to have known it was going to be controversial, right? With some of the shit that goes on in it. Well, I, and I don't think he even really had could have had the foresight to like really understand how much more we would sort of grapple with mental illness and like really try to like. I feel like especially in the most recent ten or twenty years, people are really starting to. Uh, like you know psychologists and and everybody are starting to nail down some of these mental illnesses and and figure out treatments and things that they yeah. probably didn't have back in the 70s well, and all kinds of stuff like that and i know i said i wasn't going to really touch on it that much but um that that uh exorcism i referenced before with annalise um it happened in 1976 so just okay. a few years after this movie came out so right. Which is, I don't again, know like, if that was an influence or not, but like, you yeah. know what I mean? And I don't want to blame him because I, I don't feel like that's fair, but, uh, you know, it's, it's out there in pop culture and people believe it. A lot of people believe it. Right. I, yeah. You can't prevent that from happening. And of course there is going to be those people who see it and they're like, this is, this is fact. This is true. Well, I, to... I, I want to say again, I, I haven't read that they necessarily had seen the movie and were fans of it or anything like that. These were like two right. priests who got you know ended up getting charged with crimes after the fact and the parents there's a big thing it's a really interesting case if you you know go go check it out I, I do recommend the episode on case file was one in particular i listened to that i thought was really good if you'd rather watch something uh buzzfeed unsolved did, a, did an episode on it anyway let's get to the characters uh chris mcneil is this actress and um is potentially going to be like actually making a film i think is mm -hmm. offered this this shot at it and it introduces kind of a metafictional narrative for, for me, too, that is continued with a lot of the other characters who are, like, super into movies and are constantly talking uh, yeah. about their love I really movies. like, I mean, of course, anytime that happens in a story, like, it's engaging to me. And I like to see, like, oh, if, I, I feel like I can understand the personality of a character based on, like, I really like this movie or, like, their eagerness to go to a movie theater and, like, bring mm -hmm. other people to movies and things like that. Um, it's just, like, a character trait that I like to I like to see. Um, and you know, not knowing that this would one day be adapted, it's kind of it's always nice to like have that fun little thread where it's like, oh, these characters roll into movies, and eventually this book would be turned into yeah. a movie. So I want to ask you about Chris as a character. How mm -hmm. did, how did you feel? How did you feel about her? Because I have thoughts. I mean, I like the idea of a character like you know, this is your quintessential star of in movies. I think it's like the, especially of the time. I think you're now, getting sort of the. I know this the, is kind of getting into movie territory but do you remember if this is true in the movie because i do not remember this is one thing i don't I remember, remember at all. i don't remember there being this this sort of angle i don't remember it being like a okay. movie actor and stuff but then again I, it's been too long since since i've seen it so i couldn't okay. say for sure um so yeah i mean the, the 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 actress who has you know people who are there to to cater to anything that her child needs or she needs like making them food upkeeping the house sort of having everything taken care of and then right. she uh, essentially has like servants or like housekeepers right. and right. Really, she pays to, to do assistance, all kinds, of, all kinds yeah, of stuff. Yeah. And and it's like, so this whole house is full of people. And I think it's a way to have, you know, other characters in the house. Cause if you're, yeah. you know, you're not She's wealthy. Really there's important. Not it seems like she gets invited to go like eat dinner with the president at the start of the novel. 
I think she, she has. I I th- yeah. Well, I think she has the dinner at her house, right? Not that. That's not the one. That, like the president of oh, the U.S. isn't there. I think she does go to have a president, and the, and then she also does have like, an important dinner party where an astronaut comes and all of that, like you're referencing. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But what what I'm trying to get at is she, you know, she's waited on hand and foot, uh, and then comes up against a situation with her daughter that no amount of money, no doctors can fix. Like nothing, nothing that she can do. Um, is fixing the situation and she's you know she's an atheist um, so like she didn't even think to go this route to sort of go into exorcism or to to under to try to comprehend that it was a demon like many people would you know that'd be the last thing on your mind um, so you know seeing her go from someone who's you know the height of success everything's taken care of to helpless i think is a big arc for a character to go like through th- at least to go through that sort of struggle right and uh i think you touched on uh, an important part there her being an atheist i think is really important for the story i think it shows her it shows that it it, it takes extraordinary circumstances to get to the point in which there is an exorcism performed because you you have to convince an atheist of all people that this is what is necessary but when push comes to shove like she's desperate enough to take any avenue all that being said i was disappointed that she didn't do more at the end of the book she was not really involved with the final confrontation with the demon um that has her daughter um which essentially this i was thinking about this too like this book is kind of a kidnapping or like um like a ransom story almost like an like, you know what i mean like it's like this demon is hostage is the word i'm looking for the demon is essentially holden regan hostage and they're trying to get it <laughs> to give her up um and the mother character brings in the priests um to help but then she sort of is completely sidelined at, at the end where it felt like you know we developed this character who was interesting and who had a lot of agency, right? Like, um, it's sort of lampshaded that um, she is a single mom who is pursuing her career, and you could view this as punishment, right? Um, if you wanted to get into it, this this book could be viewed as, like, a deeply conservative book, um, and I think uh, Blatty was sort of aware of that and, and sort, of, sort of lampshaded a lot of those issues and tried to undercut some of them, mm-hmm. um, because otherwise you could view it as... Of course, this happened to her daughter. She was daring to, uh, you know what I mean, pursue her own career, and she was a single mother when she should have been married, and you know all this stuff, right? Well, yeah, and just the, you know religion and divorce and all that stuff, like the like all that stuff that's built up in that, and like that's not not according to religion, that's not the right thing to do, and in any right. situation, you got to you know force force yourself through it, and well, and it's fascinating how like the cop who shows up uh, actually shows up throughout the novel, and he's sort of investigating uh the death of uh was it burke is his name yeah burke and Dennings. um who we later kind of find out was probably killed by regan the, or, or the demon possessing possessing mm-hmm. regan um anyway burke he he sort of lampshades the fact that he represents rationality and Karis represents uh sort of uh you know mysticism and even though Karis is also like deeply skeptical of the whole thing um it's funny how the author is sort of playing with these ideas. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the whole, I think the story is supposed to be seen through the lens of a of a, a Jesuit priest who is losing his faith because of sort of losing his mother, um, and then we're and then we're he's being faced with something that in the end kind of makes him find his religion again in a weird way, mm. um, but the skepticism along the way is appreciated by I think both parties of people both anybody reading it who's religious and not religious because um he, the, he's a he is a priest but he's also a psychologist and like has a background in science so like trying to to go through and find reasons for things um but also having the you know the background and the basis of the of the biblical sort of background is helpful for for this exorcist situation okay so i feel like i we got to mention uh just because i've been thinking about talking about weird shit occurring around this uh, while we were recording, my gas detector just started going off uh, momentarily, and then the power flickered, and then I think the gas detector got fried by the power flicker, and anyway, we had to do all this rigmarole to get everything back going, and we got back recording, and then I was just, just when I'm sitting down to record with you again now, I'm thinking about how that could be Pazuzu. <laughs> He's fucking with us. He's mad that we're we're talking about the exorcist again. Damn it! See, not that skeptic, my old nemesis. <laughs> the, the skeptic will become will become the believer. 
<laughs> right. Uh, anyway, uh, it's just it just goes to show how like, uh, which I think we're gonna get into more next week. How uh, a lot of circumstances can be attributed to something, even if they might just be uh, weird coincidences. Yeah. Anyway, um, we were talking about the characters. Let's talk about Father Damien Karras. Uh, we've, we've referenced him a lot, but um, I, I thought it was fascinating that he was this sort of psychiatrist, thinking man, very rational uh, for a priest. And he is sort of having this crisis of faith that uh, his arc is sort of finding his faith again through this exorcism. Um, right. So I, I read it that way. That's something I wanted to talk about in the beginning of the episode, but I think maybe we can finally talk about it here. Okay. You know, what? what's the intention of the story if, you know, there's skepticism throughout and then, you know, in the end, the priest who was sort of losing his belief found it again and, and the, you know, the way the things f- like finalized, do you think that, do you think that it was just the most interesting way to tell the story or do you think it's sort of um, because uh blatty had a background in in religion he sort of this is where he landed on it kind of situation i think it's probably a mix of both you know i think he he feels like this is the way to to end this story um because ultimately like we've referenced before this story lands on the side of this is a demon and it needs a priest to drive it out um and i think the lesson that is learned by our character uh before the end is that he has to be true to his faith and be a true believer in order to do battle with this demon. And so that's the message of the book, I think, ultimately. Right. I mean, you know, I, think I said, it comes... it's kind of a, it's kind of a traditional sort of conservative uh, book in, in many lights. If you look at it that way. Right. He, I, I do think it's interesting to think about the fact that if we're to jump, this is going to be a spoiler. So if you're not interested in that, maybe go watch it or read it or whatever you want to do before you hear this. But mm-hmm. um in the end, he's the rational thinker, right? And he's able to, in some way, use rational thinking in addition to his belief to understand how to beat this demon. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's taking it's taking him realizing the only way to do this is by me taking on this demon and then killing myself, which mm-hmm. is like sort of a, um, I would think, more like reasonable way to look at it rather than it being, you know, he's, he's kind of found the loophole is what I'm trying to say. Like he, he, he used reason in addition to finding his faith to end the battle with the demon and ultimately kind of best it. And it's fascinating too, because, you know, according to Christianity, if you commit suicide, you're, you know, prevented from going to heaven. Or did he, or is he a martyr, you know, for this child? I think it's an open question. He, he, uh, he, at the end, he has a victorious look in his eyes. Um, but did he sort of sacrifice his immortal soul in order to achieve victory? I don't right. know. I think that's an interesting question. Uh, we've gotten into, you know, way down into the plot, so I'm going to read a little bit more, and then we can kind of just freeform, go wherever. So after several unsuccessful psychiatric and medical treatments, Regan's mother, an atheist, turns to a local Jesuit priest for help as Regan's personality becomes increasingly disturbed. Father Damien Karras, who is currently going through a crisis of faith coupled with the loss of his mother. He agrees to see Reagan as a psychiatrist, but initially resists the notion that it is an actual demonic possession. After a few meetings with a child, now completely inhabited by a diabolical personality, he turns to the local bishop for permission to perform an exorcist on the child. So uh, I do want to touch a little bit on how I I love that it's set up in like sort of a series of sort of um, innocuous... Um, sort of the kind of thing that a lot of people experience in their houses where they hear like noises they can't quite place and something has been moved and they don't know why it got moved. And it's a lot of the kind of quote unquote supernatural stuff that everyday people will experience. And so it's, it's a, it's a clever way of, of getting into people's homes. Um, which is, that's the other thing is it's like, this is everybody lives somewhere or they, they might experience something like this. Um, so it's just a very uh, recognizable horror. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, compounded with the fact that when the priest does the research, it says, like, you know, these are the things that will happen first, and then it'll escalate. So, mm-hmm. like, people, then that brings up the fear of, like, oh, what if, you know, what if that, that you know, that rustling that I hear in the night is the beginning of this haunting that will mm-hmm. eventually, like, lead to more and more and possession yeah. and all this crazy Possess stuff. my child. Which, right. by the way, I think there's a whole... You could write a whole paper about sexuality in this novel and how yeah. tied to sexuality, um, especially, like, quote-unquote, deviant sexuality or women's sexuality, 
is tied to you know satanism and demons <laughs> and desecration and all this stuff right and specifically you know the daughter is too young to be having like all these like to talking the way that she's talking the doing the thing that she's doing and it it sort of plays on that fear that like parents have of their children like especially their daughters becoming sexual be, you know creatures or people and, and it's like oh my god you know like my daughter might be might be a sexual person and and i'm freaking out she must be possessed by a demon right <laughs> uh i mean you know sexuality like you said you, you could write a paper there's stuff there's the stuff that goes on with the priests you know clearly there's some sort of suppressed uh sexuality that goes on with the priests and the idea that like one of them may potentially be having uh, issues with with being closeted in some way and like this idea that he wouldn't even want to be it seemed like yeah i was picking up on that too which yeah wouldn't even want to be associated or seen in, the, in like a room with someone alone or something they're that scared that like something would be perceived or something well you could read it that way but and then you're also kind of perceiving it in the way in which they're being worried about it, it, it on the surface he's really just like a, afraid of physical intimacy of any kind or any sort of closeness with another person right and to me that's like I don't know, it's kind of an indictment on the whole system. If you feel like you can't even be close Friends with another human being, someone, you can't have yeah. a good friend because you might be perceived as being something deviant, you know? You right, know, and then like bad. you say, not to mention, I, I mean, the the trope of children and horror and like the idea of like children, you know, being possessed or just like, I mean, you see it in, in so many different stories throughout throughout horror's history, but like, it's it's terrifying because the you know the the innocent becomes the all knowing and right. sort of like you know having a child speak in tongues and and say all this crazy shit about you know like you said sexual stuff violent stuff and then and then you know that brings up the embarrassment that the that the parent feels and how she's not willing to go seek any other treatment or talk to anybody else because it's like is it seen as something that she did to to turn her child into this deviant and all that. Well, yeah, it's it's the subversion of the innocent, right? It's the it's the desecration of the innocent, and um, there's a lot that could be said about modern life and people's fear of that, and and how that you know uh, corresponds with traditional views of religion and and traditional sort of Victorian almost values <laughs> um, with surrounding puritanical values surrounding sexuality. Um, but but I'm not going to get into that too much because I also feel like uh, I, I don't have the background to like fully tackle that. But I just know that it is definitely there. And there's a lot if you want to start looking at the symbolism and like, what does this mean? And what are what are we actually exploring here? What does this represent? You can you can definitely go down a lot of different avenues. Definitely. Uh, let's just talk about th some of that stuff as well, though. The, the idea like like you said, this story sort of goes more violent, more sexually explicit, more uh, horrifying than than I was expecting from even what we see in the movie. Yeah. Uh, to be the source material and to go this far in 1971, like, I, you know, you can see why this shocked audiences. Right. And that also reminds me of this like ongoing storyline, which I am curious to know if it was in the original or not, but of these like desecrations that are going on at the same time. They keep talking about like someone broke into the church and they they might have had a black mass and then they're like reading about black masses and all this crazy shit that goes on with them and Satanists and I was unclear as to how that's connected to what was going on and I'm wondering if I don't know if this is true but I was wondering like is 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 this Blatty going back and seeding in things that link this novel to the novel he later wrote, Legion. <laughs> like, it, it was there like, is there some sort of way he's trying to connect these two because they take place in the same universe? Typically, in these kinds of stories, there's like an inciting incident. There's something that's done, and I think what's meant to be the inciting incident in this case is sort of the un the the what we get in Iran, I believe, where where the the elderly pastor like uncovers some sort of to totem or something and uh right. like well, realizes okay that, was that the inciting incident or was the black mask the inciting incident because that's that, what maybe i was gonna, that's, that's what, what it's supposed to be well that's what i was gonna get to i think that was the the moment where pazuzu is unleashed and then i think some sort of black mass like some culty stuff that's going on in the area is what sort of summons it to the area uh, but why punish that family is the question why okay. like why go because to, to she Rian? dared to be a single mother who was trying to go after her career it's funny Apparently. because like they highlight this in the book like it's said like oh it's said and sort of dismissed yet 
there's no other explanation given. Well, so you can kind of see that like he is saying that that's the reason. I mean, the psychological profile that they keep talking about is the reason why Regan or Reagan, the reason why she's going through the stuff she is and sort of like seeing a uh, whatever you call it, where your character sort of changes, like where you're seeing sort of like the doubling of her personalities, multiple personalities, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. They, they say that maybe it's due to the fact that there's like the divorce going on, the lingering that that sort of issue and that would directly put it on the mom mm-hmm. right like the idea of a divorce the reason she's going through that stuff like had there not been a divorce then yeah. the child wouldn't be going through that right well and then we also get a uh, kind of a fun scene uh or, or a series of scenes uh regan i'm gonna continue to call her regan i just don't want to call her let's regan. go with regan know. all right we're just sw- let's go regan regan negan from walking dead you know one of the same <laughs> um <laughs> anyway she's playing with a ouija board which i thought was fun and has a has a someone called captain howdy that she's having conversations with i guess you could also point to that as sort of an inciting incident you know the, Ooh, the, the ouija board welcoming, let her in yeah let yeah her in. welcoming demons into the yeah. house with a ouija board Oh, Ouija boards. I, I just, I, it kind of tickles me that Ouija boards still have this like weird place in society where people think that they're like conduits to another right. dimension or something. I don't know. It's fun. Yeah. yeah. Again, that's like, that's one, that's a bridge too far for me. You know, like I, <laughs> you know, like I've said, I don't believe in any of this stuff, but like, that's, that's like clearly a, like I, yeah. so unbelievable to me that it's like, it's hilarious. Although there is something inherently creepy about a child having an uh, imaginary friend that they call Captain Howdy, especially if some supernatural shit, sh- shit started happening. Right. I mean, it, yeah. I'd also just be worried that they were talking to a real person who they thought was imaginary. That was that would be what would really freak me out. But anyway, yeah, that's what gives me chills. Anyway, um, <laughs> it's interesting that the sexuality of Regan is sort of used against everyone present, right? Like, it's like a weapon wielded by the demon to disgust everyone i mean it's the most it's it's the farthest you can go like a child like a yeah i don't know how old she's supposed to be like 10 12 or 10 or something very yeah a child dealing with like explicit extreme sexual topics and like actually masturbating with a cross and you know like forcing people to try to and say the saying the things to people that's that is the most shocking thing you would hear come out of a child's mouth or see a child do Right. So like like that would be sort of the, the the easiest way to sort of shock people into submission. Uh, you know, like anyone in the room is going to be shocked and just like completely taken aback by that stuff. Right. And this seems like a reaction because think back like this is 1971. This is a, a time in which the country is is starting to have or starting to kind of come off of the hippie movement of the 60s. Right. And the free love movement where a lot of people were trying to break out of this puritanical view on sexuality. And we, you know, we talked about it when we covered um, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest with Ken Kesey. And I can see this as sort of a reaction to that, right? Like, we're, we're welcoming demons in. We're, you know, we're all losing our values. And, yeah. Um, this may, I, I mean, look, like Summer of Love, 1969, like this, this was like right up in there still. Like you say, like it's either a reaction to or part of that yeah. sort of that whole situation. Yeah, I don't know. It, it, I feel like there's a lot of, you know, I love that it's not any one thing, though. Like, and the book itself is also kind of aware that these connections might be drawn and does actively try and subvert some of them, um, yeah. which I do think makes it a fascinating read. And by the way, I think this book is pretty well written. I was impressed with the prose level. Um, I, I thought it was it was well paced, even though it was kind of long. And even though there were a couple of parts that dragged a little bit for me because I had seen the film, I still felt very engaged and involved in the story. And I think those are problems of having seen the book. I don't, or seen the movie. I don't think that would have happened if I had just picked this novel up when it came out. Yeah, I totally agree. That like it, it did. There were parts that dragged to me, and it, and it tended to be sort of like rehashing the research again, rehashing the medical treatments and things like that. Mm-hmm. But like you say, had I had I not seen the movie and kind of known where it was going, I don't think I would have felt that at all. I do want to point out one part that um, legitimately gave me like a jump start fright, and that was a part on the audio book. Um, okay. there's a there's a moment way late in the book where all of a sudden he listens to a recording of Regan and in the audio book it plays a different voice it's actually like a little girl speaking mm-hmm. and it startled the shit out of me just because like you get so used to like William Peter Blatty's yeah. voice and it has a certain tenor to it and you know where it can go and he's done all these different voices and he's he's even done Regan's voice so you're not expecting when we hear the recording for it to be someone else, but it's all of a sudden someone else. It's like a little girl, and it, it actually gave me a jump, like a jump scare. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Which I thought was pretty funny. <laughs> I don't know why, just because I wasn't expecting it, and I was like, who the fuck is that? Like, I thought it was like, have something talking in my real life nearby. Yeah. <laughs> it was really <laughs> weird. Awesome. 
And then I realized it was on the audiobook. Um, all right, I'm going to read the last of the summary, and then we can sort of talk about the thing as a whole and what happens at the end. So the bishop with whom uh, Karis consults does not believe that he is qualified to perform the rites and appoints the experienced Marin, who has recently returned to the United States, to perform the exorcism, although he does allow the doubt-ridden Karis to assist him. The lengthy exorcism tests the priests both physically and spiritually. When Marin, who had previously suffered cardiac arrhythmia, dies during the process, completion of the exorcism ultimately falls upon Father Karis. When he demands that the demonic spirit inhabit him instead of the innocent Regan, the demon seizes the opportunity to possess the priest. Karis heroically surrenders his own life in exchange for Regan's by jumping out of her bedroom window and falling to his death, regaining his faith in God as his last rites are read. Okay. So that's the rest of the rest of it there. I do want to uh, pause and then I'm going to read a quote um, that I thought was fascinating. Here it is. Quote, this is when Lancaster Marin first arrives. He paid the driver, then turned and stood motionless under a misty street lamp's glow, staring up at a window of the house like a melancholy traveler frozen in time. Which I think is a well-written par- like sentence, per- first off. But this is the this is the famous movie poster, yeah. right? Like this is the totally. scene, and totally. it's so cool to me that that is in the text of the book. Like I love yeah. that that is in there. When I read that, I was like, "Holy shit!" And I wonder <laughs> was that added back in? Was that an original oh, line? I want I want to believe not. that's not true. I hope I hope it was in there. Maybe it was. Yeah. That would be that would be kind of disappointing if it was if it was retroactively added. Maybe it was. I don't know. Let us know. If you read the original book, let us know. Was that sentence in there? If you remember, I'd be curious to know. Anyway, sorry. Thoughts on the, thoughts on the end of this book. Um, oh, well, we should talk about uh, Lancaster Marin. He, by the way, based off a real person. Um, he, he There was this real priest who had done some uh, exorcisms and was really, really well respected. And I think his name was also Lancaster. So he kept the Lancaster, but I think he changed the last name as like a reference to this real guy that he based this character off of. I like the sort of what I spoke of before when I sort of talked of like ancient and like respected with re, with regards to religion. Um, I think even if you're not religious and you sort of even if you hate religion, I think you can look to someone like this character in this book and see that they've dedicated their life to something that they believe in and still respect it in a way. And so showing when this character arrived, like you understood, you understood that character from a from a background perspective, but you also understood like what they stood for. You understood like what you know what I mean? It brought certain like a like a gravitas to it and like a certain amount of you felt like things might be okay based on the fact that this person who'd been there and done it was there and clearly was sort of like the the best version of a of a, a priest of this kind. You know what I mean? Like sort of it just seems like ancient knowledge. Like an older person having, you know, gone through it all nearing the end of their life and still like you know as passionate about this stuff as they always have been and i don't know there's just a certain like again i think there's a certain baggage that comes with a character like that because everybody knows what that represents kind of no i know what you're talking about um two thoughts on this character uh one i agree uh, i think there is a certain gravitas and solemnity that certain you know quote unquote holy people <laughs> holy men you know or, or women um can can sort of exude right and um, people will see it and and interpret it as holiness, right? Like as uh, this person is just so in touch with God and their and their faith is so powerful that they exude it. Um, the skeptic in me sees more a developed personality because they're aware of the effect that this has on people, and they've they've found a right. certain way to behave that has a desired effect. Um, oh, it's like it's like a subtle char- charisma as well. It's like a it's, certain yeah, exactly. Like, they're yeah. definitely very charismatic. These people like they gravitate to them a lot of times. You know, they these are also in the hands of dangerous people occasionally. I'm not saying they all are. Um, these are also the kind of people who can become cult leaders, right? If you have this magnetism to you that people are drawn to you um, and believe the things you say, if you're one of those people who that just comes naturally to you, um, you're very good at that sort of thing. Um, that's one thought. One. Um, so I do recognize this this kind of person in this novel however it has done the work of convincing me that within the fiction there is a demon (laughs) that is a real you know out the out of the out of the fucking underworld demon and who do you want to come do battle with it this guy absolutely he's a he's a superhero comes rolling in at the end of the book and you're ready you're like excited you're like hell yeah this guy's here now now it's for real 
and he's done battle with it in the past like he knows about it right the his shared history there mm-hmm. uh, and the, which makes like sort of his his whole situation that goes down the fact that he ends up dying uh you know that's you, the sacrifice that he was willing to make and and we get the moments another another huge moment of sort of like us understanding this character was uh you know there was a telegram for him and he knew he didn't even need to know what the telegram was before he knew sort of what was being called upon and he was saying goodbye to like the nature around him and stuff he's like walking around in nature saying goodbye to the birds and all of that yeah um and so just like sort of saying you know having the wherewithal to be like you know urgent message coming from me i'm an exorcist i wonder you know what could it possibly be probably you know this thing that i've felt this this pazuzu threat this like you know looming uh you know, battle that will, will eventually happen. Mm. Of course he, he like sort of knows right away that that's, what's going to happen. And is is already saying his goodbyes, knowing he probably won't make it through. So real quick, I just found the actual person. Uh, I wanted to say it. Uh, so aspects of the character of father Marin were based on the British archeologist, Gerald Lancaster Harding, who had excavated the caves where the dead sea scrolls had been found and whom Blatty had met while in Beirut. Laddie has stated that Harding, quote, was the physical model in my mind when I created the character of Marin, whose first name, please note, is Lancaster. (laughs) So he was like letting it be known. Um, So it's interesting. That wasn't actually a priest. He was an archaeologist, but uh, that I guess had that sort of gravitas and persona that that made him think of uh, that he wanted to evoke with this character. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we get the final confrontation. I, I contend that the best probably the most exciting and, and, and arguably the best scenes in the book are the confrontations with the demon and the exorcism yeah. sort of scenes. But even before the exorcism scenes, when, when it's, you know, different people just talking to the demon, very well written, very convincingly written. Um, also, if you, if you do uh, go learn about that other exorcism, there are some actual recordings of Annalise and, um, some of the stuff she would say. And a lot of this seems very based off of like real phenomenon, whether whatever the explanation is, whatever you want to believe the explanation is, whether it's suggested as, as the book actually talks about as a possibility that these are highly suggestible situations where people, um, priests come in and they start dealing with you and saying that you're, you're, uh, uh, possessed. And then you go, Oh yeah, I guess I am possessed. And you start acting it out. You know what I mean? Like these, these are situations where you can sort of be a self self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, whether or not you believe that, um, there are these re- these recordings that exist where there's some really creepy shit and noises and 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 voices that are being that are coming out and all this stuff. This all lines up with that to me. So it seems like he had done the research and knew what this was actually quote actually quote unquote <laughs> like. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah. The idea of having knowledge that you shouldn't, you know, physical feats of strength. That, that, that a lot of these things like can be you know can be explained away by like oh, subliminally, this person, you know, got this knowledge as, you know, as a child and didn't even realize it and is somehow able to pull from the memory banks, like some information that they never should have had or never should have remembered in some way. Or like, you know, the the adrenaline that that has been shown, you know, everybody's heard stories of like incredible feats of strength and times of stress and things like that. So um, a lot of that stuff, again, that's clearly talked about in the novel can be explained away for the most part. Um, so yeah, I, I think it is good to have sort of the, the foundation of skepticism to show how real in this story this demon is. And, and it, I don't know, it works for me. Absolutely. So into the novel, uh, f- final thoughts. How does it, how does it play out for you? Um, did you feel satisfied by the way, the way things turned out? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I think seeing, uh, Lancaster Marin's sacrifice was, was pretty weighty. I guess I do agree with you though, like the sort of, um, the cop and the mother didn't really end up doing yeah. as much as you would have thought with all the setup. I think it's notable that the cop doesn't appear in this plot summary I found, <laughs> um, even though you spend a lot of time from his point of view as he's doing right. the investigation. I mean, the I, I feel the investigation is the investigation is interesting, too. And yeah. it's like, what what sells him that? What, why doesn't he want to press charges? I don't remember the exact. He ends up being why. convinced by Mayor. Um, Karis, I think, right. essentially, that um, it's best There's left to other authorities other than himself, like that there is yeah. something else going on here. Seems very, uh, coming from the person of reason, you know, he had, he said himself that he is the person of reason in the yeah. whole scenario, like just taking well, somebody's... Well, and, and if he represents that in the reader, then him saying, okay, I'm going to let you take 
take center stage and I'm going to let you tackle this is telling us we have permission to let our, our rational mind take a back seat. You know what I mean? Like, I, I feel right. like he represents that for the reader as well. Um, so I think, yeah. I guess that was the tactic. Although, yeah, I, his storyline then kind of fizzles out. Although he is at the very end, um, having a conversation with the third priest and, uh, the final line of the book is in forgetting they were trying to remember. Um, which I wanted to get your take on that last line and like what you think that that could mean. They're talking about they're talking about movies at the end. Actually, they're having this conversation about oh, you look like Humphrey Bogart, and he's like oh yeah yeah, and then and then that's the line we get at the end. And forgetting well, they, they he says the you know the beginning beginning of a beautiful friendship and all that from yeah. from Casablanca. So I guess I'm not really remembering the exact context of it though. So is it like is it like he who is who is doing the forgetting? Let me question. let me read a little bit more. I, I should have written okay. down more of the final quote if we want to tackle this. Okay. Right. So, yes, it is. Um, it is the detective uh, talking with Dyer, uh, Kinderman talking with Dyer. He says, I'm reminded of, the, of a line in the film Casablanca, he said fondly. At the end, Humphrey Bogart says to Claude Rains, Luis, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. And he says, you know, you look a little bit like Bogart. And he says, you noticed. And then the final line of the book is in forgetting they were trying to remember. Oh yeah, so so to me, it's it's in forgetting all the the horrible stuff that has gone on throughout the story. It was their way of sort of still remembering the people who had died in order for, to to sort of bring peace to this kid or whatever. Yeah, at least that's my you know my well, gut reaction. Well, and, and, to and uh, I think even more than that, I think it's an interesting line because I think it's talking about how you have to sort of move on from really traumatic events in your life, and you don't really forget them, but you allow yourself to at least momentarily forget them. And then you, in doing that, you um, are remembering what it's like to live normally, like to have a normal life, to be interested in movies and talk about stupid shit. And right. in order to do that, on some level, you have to forget the big traumatic thing. Uh, otherwise, you'll never be able to do that. You'll never be able to live a normal life. So I think that, to me, that's what that line is. But I like it because it's sort of open-ended. Like, I, I would definitely be open to other interpretations of that of that final line. Yeah. Um, so I think it's an interesting one. All right. So I think that's going to be it for this week. But we will be back next week. Uh, we're hoping to have a guest on that will have a lot to say about this movie. So fingers crossed that that actually plays out. Um, but we're going to be, either way, we're going to be discussing this film, which I know there's a lot of really interesting stuff that went on during production and after and the controversy surrounding it. Uh, also just a super well-known, just massive film. So it'll be really, really, uh, exciting to talk about. We wanted to thank our patrons this week. Um, just shout out to all of them because of them. We're able to keep this podcast going in its current form and, you know, continue to improve equipment and that sort of stuff, reinvest in the podcast. So to everybody who's supporting us over there, thank you. And if you wanted to learn how to support on Patreon, go to patreon.com forward slash ink to film. Yeah, we got all kinds of bonus content on there. Definitely check it out. Uh, a lot of good value for a small amount of money, in my opinion. Um, also, if you enjoyed this episode, you enjoyed this sort of long form discussion, uh, please let us know in the form of a rating and review on whatever podcast app you use and tweet at us, you know, comment on our stuff on Facebook or whatever. Let us know. Reach out to us. Uh, we love to hear from our listeners. Connect with us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, all of those at ink to film and definitely make sure to join the council linklings on Facebook. We post polls for upcoming projects, to help us select sort of the next project that we would be covering. We post adaptation news. We post all kinds of stuff in there that basically just pertains to ink and film movies and, and books. So <laughs> yeah. if you wanted to stay connected and, and see some of that cool stuff, check it out. Yeah. It's one of the two places where we probably have the most discussion is in our council of inklings on Facebook. And then our, we have a ink to film, uh, book club on goodreads where we also have some discussion and some, some sort of forum like posts so if you want to go somewhere where you can talk with like fellow fans of whatever you know we're, we're talking about and have discussions about it those are good places to do it all right so that's going to do it for this week uh you know i really enjoyed covering this book so far i'm looking forward to the movie it's going to be it's a Absolutely. massive one for sure like we've talked be about. on the lookout for creepy shit man every little creepy thing i want to have a report back to me next week what's been going on in your life you know yeah uh, i will i'm expecting i'm fully expecting to leave this this room where i'm recording right now and something to happen so i'll yeah. keep you posted whenever you see it happen i just want you to go pazuzu like yell right. out the name <laughs> <laughs>
I don't know. Maybe I'm gonna ma- I'm gonna try to manifest it. I'm gonna try to say say I welcome you in. Okay, then we can have right. Zuzu on the podcast next week, and we can interview him. That'll be really interesting. I ordered a I ordered a Ouija board off of Amazon, so like it's on <laughs> the way. I'll let you know how it goes. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Uh, that's gonna be it. Uh, until next time. Thanks for listening. <laughs>